you're on the air with Florenza, your podcast destination for authentic conversations with a twist. So grab your favorite drink, get comfy, and join me on this unique literary journey. Cheers! Joining me is Rhonda Broder. So guys, I have got to read a little bit about what she is doing here in these literary streets. All right, and I do need to just give a little alibi. Y'all know I like to be very transparent. And this is one of my cousins. If you think that I am doing some things in the literary field, it's because I'm surrounded by literary giants such as Rhonda. She holds a Bachelor's of Art in English. And in 2019, she's the Cleveland champion. Rhonda is a journalist, manuscript editor, entrepreneur, and author of a fabulous mystery, guys. It's titled Riddles. Beyond her literary achievements, Rhonda is a dedicated advocate for literacy and humanitarian causes. Connect with her and explore her literary world via her website, and we're going to have that information for you um, in just a bit. So give it up for Rhonda Crowder. I need to get some little applause or something there. I love your intro. Thank and thanks you. for the introduction. You are welcome. Now, you know, I just kind of hit and miss because I'm always scarfing, you know, scrounging on the internet, looking up bits and pieces. So tell us a little bit about yourself and about your your book riddles, which, um, you know, I read as soon as I got my copy of it. Mm -hmm. So tell us a little bit about that. So, um... I'm born and raised here in Cleveland. Very proud of that. Love being in Northeast Ohio. I left and went away a couple of times, but always found myself back here. And um, I think, it, you know, I can attribute the Cleveland Public Library as one of the places that helped me develop a love for reading and, dis and to discover this passion I have for writing. So my book Riddles is my debut novel, and it's a mur it's a murder mystery, as as you said. Um, it was inspired. The inspiration came to me when I lived in Atlanta, and so the story is set in Atlanta. Although my main character is originally from Cleveland, and um, it's a dead girl in the VIP room of a strip of an Atlanta strip club. Uh, no one is interested in really finding out who murdered her. They just, you know, trying to hurry up, sweep it under the rug and get back to business as usual, except for one girl that works there who is troubled by this murder in her name. Um, her stage name is Riddle. And so she, you know, goes on to just kind of really begin to do some amateur investigations, being nosy, snooping around. And people are telling her she's crazy. She needs to leave it alone. There's no telling what this girl did to someone for them to murder her that way. And just as she began to accept that narrative herself, she receives a piece of information that forces her to keep on going and, and ultimately uh, solve the mystery. Now, this was set in a strip club in Atlanta, and I know that you spent some time in Atlanta. Now, were you actually in a strip club when this thought came to you, or it was just a cool well, it, out, Yes. In Atlanta at the time, it was very common for people to, like, everybody hung out at the strip clubs yep. in Atlanta. And so I'll never forget sitting there, and I looked over, and it was the door to the VIP room. And I peeked in and it's like, somebody could get killed in there and nobody would ever know. Nobody would know it. <laughs> nobody, like, that's how, like, private and this room was. I was in that, because I had already had the idea of wanting to do a murder. Okay. Initial, initially, my murder was going to be a murder in a newsroom. Okay. And. I kind of got stuck on this detective fiction um, genre because my senior seminar in college was in detective fiction. So after studying detective fiction for an entire semester, I had to complete this class and write 
papers on it and all that kind of stuff in order to graduate, I got stuck on this idea that I wanted to do a murder mystery. So my initial idea for a murder mystery was a uh, murder in a newsroom. Okay. I was working for the college newspaper at the time and it was some like quirky things going on. So that was my initial idea. But then being in Atlanta, I got this idea to do a murder in a strip club. And it was like, okay, people like murders, people like strippers. I think that's a good. That's a good combo. (laughs) (laughs) Now, is there a part two or do you see yourself continuing with this genre? There is definitely a part two. It is a part two. Currently, I would say it's in second draft. It still needs some more work to it. Um, I will probably write one more book in this series. So I, I kind of envision three books in this series. I don't know if I will continue to write detective fiction. Detective fiction is, is hard writing. It like is hard fiction writing. writing in my mind is pretty difficult. You know, when you try to create a world and this, this narrative and this story and keeping people engaged. But with detective fiction, there is a lot of nuances that come along with the genre that you have to be really mindful of. It it takes a lot of thought. And so it took me a really long time to write riddles, to get it done, to get it to a place where I felt like it was, you know, ready to share with the world. And part two has taken, I've had, oh my God, that's a whole, it's a whole story behind uh-huh. <laughs> part two. <laughs> But I do have part two and second draft, and it's um a, a legal it's it's a it's a murder case okay. embedded in this story, and because of that, so I have the story, I have the bones, all of that in place. But now I have to go through and make sure all of the legalities and the procedural stuff is correct. And so that's where, um, so I'm at that point where I got to start digging into the research to finish that story. And I love that you referenced the fact that it's in second draft. Um, You and I both work with authors and inevitably we will run into someone that says, oh, I just wrote a book and I'm ready to publish it with no concept that that first draft, man, you may as well flush it by all intents and purposes. Like, it's like the dirty water that comes out the the spigot when you first turn it on. It's water, yes. but it's not useful for much. Exactly. You know? And so in addition to being an author, you are also an editor. Um, and I'm going to put your link um, in the information so that other authors are able to reach out to you for editing and marketing. But why is editing so important? Editing is where the magic happens. It's where the story comes to life. Always, I've actually taught a class through Literary Cleveland um, once called The Magic is in the Rewrite. Because like you said, that first draft is not good. It it, it just, it can't possibly, the way the brain works, it cannot possibly be (laughs) any good. It needs some work. Well, for those who are um, listening to the recording, we are in the Cleveland area and are um, in the midst of some type of freaky weird windstorm. So Rhonda was bumped offline just as she was telling us about the importance of editing and why authors should uh, invest in editing, professional editing. And um, one of the beautiful things that she said is editing is where the magic happens. Now, if you go to her website, you'll also see a quote that she says, an author who edits for themselves is equivalent to an attorney that represents themselves. And so um, I think that about summed up the whole editing thing. Now, in addition to being an editor, you also work with local organizations um, to help with literacy. Tell us about some of those organizations and why they're so near and dear to your heart. Literacy and reading saved my life. My mother read to me as a little girl. And so I developed this love for reading very young. And I grew up in the inner city here in Cleveland and eventually straight, kind of straight away from reading or at least reading books. Um, 
started to not perform as well in school, you know, hanging out with the wrong crowd, those types of things. And I, I tell people all the time, I barely graduated from high school. Barely. That's a whole nother story too. <laughs> but I think I always remember that it was once I began to discover really good books, particularly mm-hmm. by people of color, like I remember reading um Black Boy by Richard Wright. And um I know why the cage bird sings by Maya Angelou, very young, at a very young age. It was those it was reading those books that began to inspire me to um wanna do something different with my life, to become a writer. And so I know what books did for me in my life as a young um girl growing up here in, in the inner city of Cleveland. And so I'm a firm believer that if we can read we can do anything anything is possible so i'm i'm just really passionate about you know sharing that love for reading with other with other people who come from communities like the one i came from yeah and when i was reading over even though we're related um when i was reading over all the information you know preparing for today's show i read how maya angelou's book was just so profound you and that you had never heard of her. And I remember vividly the first time that I read um, I Know Why Cage Bird Sings. And it was as if someone had read my entire soul. Never before had I read anything like that that spoke so just uniquely to me. And again, very young age, um, grew up in Cleveland as well. And reading was a very big part of my life is also why I ensure that it was a big part of my daughter's life. Now you are a volunteer coordinator with Huff Reeves and tell us what that organization is. So Huff Reeves is not necessarily an organization, it's more of an initiative. And so Huff Reeves is a little free library neighborhood initiative. So we um, we grew out of the Little Free Library movement. A friend of mine, dear, dear friend of mine, Margaret Bernstein, who was a former uh, plain dealer reporter who eventually, um, well, she's now the community development person, director of community development for WKYC. She was on the board of Little Free Library. And so Little Free Library decided that they wanted to take the whole concept of making free books available they want to go beyond that and they came up with this concept of little free library neighborhoods and so they launched the very first little free library neighborhood in slavic village and they had such huge success over there that she wanted to continue this movement across the city and the next community that she had had identified was the huff community and one day just you know in conversation hey what are you up to that sort of thing I learned about her interest in wanting to um, do this project in Huff. And she said, well, you know, um, I would love for you to help me, but you're my friend. I can't ask you to do anything for free, Um, you know, but I really would like to go into this community. I said, Margaret, today is your lucky day. (laughs) (laughs) Today is the day. (laughs) Today is the day. You know, not only am I passionate, just as passionate as you about literacy and encouraging people to read, I grew up in Huff. So Huff, you know, my heart is in Huff. Um, and so I decided to take on this project and, and I told her we'll figure it out. Whatever funds we need, you know, to execute things like that, we'll figure it out. And that's what we did. So we went in to the Huff community, you know, with the thought of just promoting literacy and doing it in a fun, non-academic way. So our charge was to have at least one event per month. Um, it could be an existing event where we just showed up and gave out free books, or it could be an event that we created. So we did a combination of both of that. We partnered with all of the, um, major stakeholder institutions in that community, like, uh, Fatima Family Center and Lexington Bell and Rainey Institute and the Huff Martin Purpose Center, the library. And we would just go around the community giving away books, having um, read-alouds. We partnered with the Baseball Heritage Museum, and we had a great time just really getting people excited 
about reading. Um, we did a marketing, uh, a public awareness campaign in the community because basically, you know, me being in the space of marketing promotions, communications, PR, things like that, I just leaned on all the things that I knew to do and, and put it into this campaign. And it turned out to be a very successful campaign. It's still a lot of work to be done in the Huff community. Um, COVID kind of threw us off a little bit and we still been trying to regroup in terms of Huff. But then that led to us creating Dickens Reads, which is a, is a tutoring program at Charles Dickens School where we actually go in and um, coordinate volunteers to come in and tutor. Right now we're tutoring second, third, and fourth graders okay. at Charles Dickens School in reading. Um, and then the big shebang was Cleveland Reads. Yes. Um, which both Margaret, myself, and my partner Wayne, who was very much involved in the literacy work as well, we all were a part of de- helping to develop and execute that campaign as well. And I love Cleveland Reads. Um, I've had the ability to, um, do limited work with them and with Margaret. Um, so that's been wonderful. And that's one of the things that I've looked forward to returning back home to Cleveland. Now, if there's an author that's listening right now and they are passionate as well about literacy, what are some of the things that you would recommend that they do in their own communities as far as to bring awareness to their own backyard? You know, you could do something as simple as going over to the local school in your community and reading to a classroom, um, coordinating a book drive and, and and distributing books to children in need. You know, what I've come to discover is that a lot of our children don't have books in the home. You know, and I think back on my childhood, it was always the book in the home. It was always something to read. When I would get bored, my mother would be like, go read a book. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's proof. I, I can't, um, spit out the stats right now, but it's proven. It's proven statistics that children who have books in the home and children that are read to do better in school, they do better academically. So little things like that. I mean, of course you can do, you know, you can come up with creative ways to promote literacy, but just the basic things like pick pick a school and go over to the school and, and read to the student. Yeah, I was trying to find the alarming unbelievable statistic in terms of age appropriate books that are in um our our homes that are um where the children are most vulnerable to illiteracy and initially i thought it was going to be like okay one age appropriate book per 10 or per 20 it was hundreds if not thousands and that just blew my mind that we have homes where there are absolutely no age appropriate books for children, um, books at all, but especially age appropriate books. And I think that that is what led to me subconsciously writing children's books and the type of books that I write that they are, um, engaging, they're interactive, they're fun to read. They do have, um, messages, but the messages are so well hidden that like, I forget that I even started with the intent of having a message in there. It's like a little bit of medicine and a whole bunch of sugar. So, um, but it gets the job done with your love for children and in increasing their literacy awareness. Do you see yourself ever becoming a children's book author or a YA author? I actually do have, um, two ideas for children's books. And one I've kind of sketched out in my notebook of ideas. <clears throat> and the second one is in my head. But I do want to point out that I do have a love for children reading. But I even have a more stronger love for encouraging adults to read as well. Because I think that's where a lot of times we miss the mark. There are mm-hmm. a lot of adults who um are have low literacy, right? They're reading at um, level one and level two, which is roughly below like a fifth or sixth grade level. And I've come to learn that this is my philosophy. Some people may disagree, but 
illiteracy is the root of all other ills. 100%. I completely agree. And so if we continue to ignore the problem of adult literacy, we'll continue to pour into children that will go back home to these parents who, I'm not going to say don't value reading because maybe they do and just don't know how and don't know what the next steps are in order to correct, you know, this mishap that happened in their life. Um, the cycle just continues. It continues. Absolutely. And, you know, there's a popular um, comedian and not listing names um, who was um, known for his reading and read thousands and thousands of books just before um, a, being a teenager. And he referenced in an interview that he did that the removal of books were a punishment mm -hmm. to him. And so I agree with you that especially in homes where beyond not having books or literacy where you don't have emotional or mental stability. And so you have a child who loves to read and perhaps is learning and growing and discovering ways of communication that may have reached beyond the ability of the adult in the home. And if that adult isn't grounded, if they aren't balanced, if they don't understand that this isn't disrespect because the child can out communicate them um they will view that as disrespect and and that will bring on more punishment to the child because they do have these literary abilities so i completely agree with what you're saying now is this what started the book club nights that you do for adults and is that still something that's continuing um I have not done a book club for adults, or maybe I was—I don't know. But I've, I've done so much. What, what do you have there? <laughs> okay, so you know what, and it just may be that um, there was a book club for adults that was taking place in one of the um, wineries. Were you involved at all with? That oh, one? okay. So that was a part of Huff Reads. So okay. that was one of our Huff Reads events. And because I wanted to not focus solely on children, I said, let's do an, e a, an adult event. And we had, um, it, it was at Chateau Huff, which is, uh, in right on 66 and Huff, um, a, a winery founded by a dear friend of mine, the late Nashville Frazier, who also had a love for reading and writing as well. Um, and, we read uh, Gabrielle Union's I'm Gonna Need More Wine. Oh, speaking of wine, I forgot to toast our interview today. And I have been sipping on my red blend. I don't know if you have a drink near you. But um, now, is this something that you see yourself continuing? Because I would love books and wine together. Oh, my gosh. Well, you know, I'm cool. open to all any and all book related, literary related ideas. So absolutely. absolutely. And we need to make this happen. We yeah. will talk offline. So to the listeners that are here in the Cleveland area, be listening out for um for this book club that's gonna take place in a winery near you. Now, Rhonda, where are the listeners able to follow you and where are they able to purchase your book riddles? So Riddles is only available on Amazon Kindle on Kindle right now. If you don't have a physical Kindle device, you can download the Kindle app on your phone. Um, I have not went back to print yet just because I got so many other things going on. Right. My book, <laughs> you know, my book is almost, it'd be like, I, I have to come back sometimes and check myself. Like you're treating your book like a stepchild. <laughs> I gotta be nice to the book, baby. Don't just My, leave it outside I do, to you know, grow. I, I will be going back to print um, probably early summer of this year, especially as I begin to wrap up part two and and you know start to create some buzz about that. But you can find the book on Amazon, Riddles by Rhonda Crowder. Um, I am on all social media as Rhonda underscore Crowder or on Facebook. I think it's Rhonda Crowder on Facebook, but Rhonda underscore Crowder and it's Rhonda with an H. I also should probably put, just put it out there that, um, riddles have been adapted to a screenplay. 
Nice. So yes. So a friend of mine, a dear friend of mine, the, the opportunity came before me. Um, maybe a year and a half or so ago, um, and a filmmaker wanted to adapt it to a screenplay. That kind of didn't pan out. Just a lot of you know the tech, you know, logistics, logistic look stuff. Um, but my my friend who brought the um, opportunity to me is a screenwriter. Um, he had been dabbling in writing screenplays for a while, and so. I said, well, you know, we could just go ahead and do this ourselves. And so he has um, drafted a screenplay. We have, we've conducted a table read. And um, he's kind of like been talking to some potential directors. So we, we are not, you know, into any production phase or any like that thing like that as of yet. But the screenplay is like in physical. <laughs> it's in physical form. Nice. Well, you have yes. to keep us posted on that, and we will for certain have you back to discuss how that's developing. Um, most people that know me know that um, I am working a situation with one of my early reader chapter books to make it a um, play for middle school. And so um, they just have s so many components in there that's just so perfect for middle school. So um, my best wishes to you for that, that it just fully comes to fruition and that we will see that at one of the upcoming film festivals yes. and that it wins a lot of awards. So before I let you go, as is my tradition, we have a rapid fire questions and for you, it actually is this or that. So you don't have to okay. think too hard. I'm going to give you two options and you just holler out the option that comes to mind. Okay. All right. Are you ready? Yes. Okay. Thrift store or retail store? Retail. Mac or PC? PC. Art museum or natural history museum? Oh, that mm -hmm. one's tough. Art. Oh, um, cups in the cupboard or right side up or upside down? Upside down. Upside down. Trains or plane? Train. Yes. Formal or casual? Casual. Mystery novel or sci-fi? Ooh, mystery. Oh, day. <laughs> Polka dot <laughs> or stripes? What was that? Polka dot or stripes? Stripes. And last one, card game or board games? Board game. Nice. Well, thank you so much, Rhonda, for joining us. And thank you for staying on with us. Even though we had that hiccup in the interim, I will be certain to um, invite you back when your story is available for us to view. And so um, thank you so much for joining us. You're welcome. Thank you so much for having me. And this wraps up another episode of On the Air with Florenza. You may follow me on all social media platforms under Florenza Lee or via my website at florenza.org. Until next time, cheers. <laughs>